On today's World Insight, short-sighted rhetoric and policies detract from long-term visions for China-U.S. ties, warned by John Thornton, who believes in this most important bilateral relationship, be it rain or shine. The two countries must, in the end, understand and act on the idea that they have got to have a good relationship as the leaders of the world. Welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Let's continue our series of conversations with people in the know from both China and the U.S. following the meeting of the Chinese and American presidents in San Francisco. Today, let's meet John Thornton, the chair emeritus of the Brookings Institution, co-chair of the Asia Society. Mr. Thornton, what a pleasure to see you. Good morning. Nice to see you. Um, I see you're traveling to China this time with a long stretch of time. What is your assessment of the ambience here in terms of how people understand the current state of China-U.S. relations, particularly leading up to the election year? Well, first of all, the first thing I want to say is I've been here now each, each of the last three months. And each time I've been struck by the fact that there are far fewer Westerners here than than before COVID, and it's very noticeable to me. Uh, on your on your question, I think. Um, and what does that say to you? I tend I tend personally to underestimate the tale of big events. So the tale of COVID strikes me as longer than I would have thought, and I would have thought there would have been a return to a more sort of normal pattern faster. So it says to me it's taking longer than I would have anticipated. Uh, it's going in the right direction, but it's just slow. Of course, it's not just COVID, right? It's other factors also come in. Yes, definitely. I mean, there are, you know, I've had very serious senior Americans say to me they think that China is uninvestable. I've had other ones say that they are uh, fearful of coming to China. And uh, both of those, both of those uh, points of view I find rather startling. And they, I don't recognize them, but it, it is a, it's a reality. But many people are very glad that you are here because you have been serving as a very stable bridge between China and the United States even during the most difficult years. Well, I believe in the, first of all, I believe in China. I believe in the relationship. I believe that the, uh, that a healthy U.S.-China relationship is absolutely vital to the world. Uh, and I believe in backing up what I think, what I believe. And so uh, I came here right through COVID uh, three or four times. And now I'm trying to come every single month. Do you see ambience change? every time when you come back, particularly recently after the summit in San Francisco between the two presidents? Yes, I think that the, now these of course, these are sort of subtle. Right, of course, it's, it's personal kind of. Yeah, it's anecdotal, but I would say yes. I would say people in China seem to me to be more uh, hopeful and optimistic about the uh, US-China relationship. Uh, and I think they'd like to see it uh, in better shape. And um, they'd like to see all the good things that come out of it come back at least as, at least as strong as they were before, if not better. So yes, I, do, I, see, I see definitely a, a positive change. Will they be disappointed given the election year is coming up in the US? Well, first of all, I would say I tend to think of things over long stretches of time. I think the trajectory or the trend is very clear, and the trend is a, is a positive one over time, uh, both within each country and between the countries. Now, 
if you ask just about 2024, I think they could be disappointed in the sense that the rhetoric will be harsh. The reality, the substance, I think is going to continue to go forward. And so disappointed on one level and not on another, I guess is what I would say. After San Francisco summit, many believe it takes a lot to implement. Now, what do you see as the priority of implementation in order to follow up on the spirit of San Francisco summit between the two presidents? Well, the first thing I want to say about San Francisco is that the speech that uh, President Xi Jinping gave, uh, I thought was excellent. At the dinner? At the dinner. And I was in the room, and I was also present at the prior uh, private reception. And the speech, as I was listening to it, and as I was watching the people in the room and how they were reacting, mm -hmm. it suddenly occurred to me that the speech was actually directed at the American people. Not, it was not a speech directed at the American business community. And if you recall, a lot of his speech was dedicated to uh, examples of people-to-people -people exchanges and the positive impact. At one point, he, he, he asked the, the most important question of all. He said, uh, we have a choice. We can be adversaries or we can be partners. And then a few sentences later, he answered his own question and he said, China wants to be a partner and friend of the United States. He was very clear, very simple. No one in the room could be under any ambiguity as to what he was saying. Now, I start with that because uh, I had recently, for my own purposes, uh, encouraged Frank Luntz, the very, uh, very prominent pollster in the United States, to do a survey of ordinary Americans about China, U.S. China, uh, the Chinese people, the Chinese government, and, and related matters. And he did a, a very large survey, and he came back and he said, the most, uh, the strongest piece of the U.S.-China relationship by a long way uh, are the people-to-people -people relations. Mm -hmm. He said, when you poll ordinary Americans and you, and you ask them, how do you feel about China? 79% are either unfavorable or neutral. If you ask the American people, how do you feel about the Chinese people? 81% are favorable or neutral. So I was struck by the fact that President Xi's focus on people to people and the analytical underpinning of a survey uh, supporting that same view uh, says to me that the focus in the speech was exactly right. and. That gets to your question, which is, what's the single most important thing to implement? My own view is the single most important thing to implement uh, is as massive a people-to-people -people series of exchanges as one, as one can have. We should have as many American tourists as possible coming to China. You remember in, in President Xi's speech, he mentioned inviting 50,000 American students to come here. That's very important. Uh, cultural exchanges, uh, sports exchanges. Uh, we should, be, we should be, look at that as a kind of uh, investment in the future of the world. And if you look at it that way, uh, it's a very inexpensive investment. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that we should be focusing on. And now, one more thing to say uh, on, on priorities. Of course, the other priority that goes without saying, but is absolutely vital, is the avoidance of confrontation. And uh, under all circumstances, as far as I'm concerned, it's absolutely essential that there's no confrontation between the two countries. But how? That is a question, isn't it? Well, yes, it's a, it's a very good point. Another, another thing I feel strongly about is that the, the ways in which the two governments engage needs to change. It needs to catch up to the 21st century. Tell me more about that. Well, I think at the moment, the two governments engage more or less the way they have for a long time. And we're in, a, we're in a whole new world. The world is changing and it's changing fast. And in that new world, the U.S. and China and that relationship is right at the center. And because it's at the center, the way I look at this, starting at the very top, the two presidents, Xi 
should be talking to each other with great frequency. They should be seeing each other in person uh, as many times as possible. And then the key people who work for them at the cabinet level, the state council level, they should also be told, your job is to get, is to build a close relationship with your counterpart. So that at a minimum, both sides have got extremely good information about exactly what each side thinks and why they think it and what's important to them and what's a little less important and what's not important. I think that that would have a very big impact on uh, the practical thinking and the practical decision making that goes on day to day, week to week, month to month. And I think that's the single best way to, to lower the possibility of confrontation. What does it take to do that? It takes, uh, it, ta it takes leadership. It takes, it takes the, the two top leaders saying we both consciously recognize the world has changed and we're going to change our own behavior mm -hmm. and we're going to, we're going to uh, tell our key people to change their behavior. Now anyone who's run anything knows changing behavior is not easy because you have habits that have existed for years. But it absolutely has to happen. It's, just, it's, just, it's too important an issue for it not to happen. Is that what you have noticed from the Chinese private entrepreneurs to the laymen on the street since you've been here in Beijing for a couple of weeks well, already this say, time? I would say that the Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, some of them who have already been successful, are um, more conservative than I would have thought. In terms of? In terms of thinking, well, maybe we should be diversifying Maybe we should be a little bit more conservative in, our, in the rate of our investment. Maybe we should let, sort of see how this is going to play out. Mm -hmm. However, uh, as, I, as I like to say, for every uh, one or two of the highly successful ones, there are thousands of young people, aged 21, 23, 27, who want to be that successful person. <laughs> and they are working uh, very hard to be that. And, uh, and China's got just the, the depth of talent the breadth of talent, the scale of the ambition, the hunger, the desire to uh, succeed. There's, there's just too many really outstanding people. So I, I don't think that's going to slow down. So the surplus of reform and opening up is still there? Yes. You talk about national security. Um, some, many argue that the pendulum has been swaying too much to the sides of so-called national security without looking at the efficiency, without looking at the potential. What's your opinion? You know, I agree with that. And I think that on both sides? Or? On, bo on both sides. But I think that's not surprising. I think that when you have a kind of jolt, a change that's, that's quite sudden, mm -hmm. it's sort of typical of people, and particularly of, in of institutions and bureaucracies, to overreact or overcorrect. And that'll go on for some period of time, and then it will start to come back the other way. Uh, but it takes time. So I don't think we should be surprised by that or even alarmed by it because it's, it's, it's not, to me, it's natural. And it does have a tremendous impact on the businesses, one could argue. Uh, for example, the tech sector. Many of the, a few chip companies that have been, a uh, majority of their business coming from China and Asia, have to make China-oriented chips. Yes. Mm. Uh, some even called it Cold War version of chips. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a, it's kind of a cold, cold economic war. Cold economic war is it? I don't think so. I think that it's. I, I do think that the both systems have gone too far. I do think it'll 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 settle out over time. There'll be some pain in the meantime. There'll be some unreasonable regulations and unreasonable laws written. Uh, and uh, but both systems will, will correct. You know, business people, entrepreneurs are very very. Uh, savvy, adaptable people, and they'll figure out what, another way to do something better. And uh, and I think also it will be learned over time 
is that because the world is so interconnected and so interdependent, and also because uh, there's no monopoly on talent. There's talent all over the world. What will happen over time is the governments will realize you simply can't create a closed system. It doesn't work. It may work for a short period of time, or even for five, ten years, but over time it doesn't work. So we all need to be a little bit philosophical, retrospective. I think so. What do you see as the nature of relationship between business community and government or policy makers these days? Where you're from, for example, regarding the China issue? Well, first of all, uh, one thing I should have said earlier, the second most important dimension to the U.S.-China relationship Sorry. after people to people mm -hmm. uh, is the business relationship or the economic ties. So it's absolutely, it's very, very important. And uh, for that reason, I think that China would be well advised to uh, go back to something they used to do quite frequently. In the old days, you'll remember that uh, that it was very common for Chinese leaders to meet one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with Western business leaders, Western thought leaders. That diminished in recent years, uh, and that's problematic in, in two ways. Number one, high-quality information from some of the best people in the world goes into the Chinese system at the very top. That's valuable to China. Directly? Directly. Not, not filtered. Not, uh, secondly, uh, very high quality information from the Chinese side goes out to the Western side. And so when those people go home, they say, well, I just met with Premier so-and-so or Vice Premier so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, they feel very good about what they heard. It's extremely important. Now, to, to your question about uh, the business community in the United States, uh, look, the business community in the United States is extremely important. The United States is a, is a business-centric culture. And the business community and the people who own the, who own the businesses are also the financial backing to the political system. So, so there's a very, very close sort of symbiotic relationship. Now, when the government or, or the political leaders start to change in, in dramatic ways, of course it shakes the business community because the business community likes certainty, predictability, um, uh, and anything that's not certain and predictable, they don't like. But, the, but again, they're adaptable, they're smart, mm -hmm. and so they adapt. And, um, and they give their advice privately, and they try, to be, uh, they try to be forces for good, and by and large they are. Mm -hmm. But again, sometimes it takes time, and there's give and take, and uh, again, that's, you know, we're, we're all very used to that. It's nothing, nothing unusual. I've been talking to some of those active figures of the record over the years who have been going between Beijing and Washington uh, trying to uh, talk to both sides about what they felt about the business environments in different places. Um, recently talking to them it's given me a certain kind of impression, but that's only anecdotal, that there seems to be some soul searching among some members of the business community uh, recently, particularly given the realities of U.S.-China relations. The political situation in the United States at the moment, as unhealthy as it is, uh, is not uh, unique, it's not an aberration, and it's not simply the function of one person, former, former President Trump. Uh, there was a famous historian, American historian, who wrote a book in 1964 uh, called the paranoid style in American politics. And what that book basically says is if you go back to the beginning of the founding of our country, all the way to the present day, what you'll find is a sort of paranoid gene in the American system, which is essentially latent, but every so often it surfaces. And it typically surfaces when ordinary people are having difficult times and a populist charismatic leader comes along and he or she uh, feeds the fears of ordinary people. And she typically explains to them, the reason your life is difficult mm -hmm. is because of this external malevolent force called communism or called Chinese. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, and in fact, the historian who wrote this book was inspired to write it because of the emergence of Joe McCarthy in the 1950s. So what we're seeing now fits into that thesis perfectly. And when this occurs, it typically lasts for a decade or two. We're about a decade into it now, the way I trace it. And so we've got a, probably another decade to run. Now, the relevance of it is that in those circumstances, ordinary Americans are essentially very wary of and even uh, have a sense of antipathy towards the leadership class. And the leaders, therefore, uh, in, 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 this, in this sort of pattern, what happens is le leaders who know better do one of two things. They either do nothing, which is not terribly helpful, or worse, they join this, the, the front of the movement and they push the movement. And um, we're seeing that right now. And the relevance of that is that is underpinning and giving oxygen to certain policies which the business community will regard as unhelpful, unconstructive, and not very smart. Now, going back to your original question, uh, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that certain business people have told you that they look back and wonder, uh, did they push too hard historically? Or in the right direction. Or in the right not. direction. Okay. I'm not surprised by that. I guess I would say, what I would say to that is, I think where the, where the United States made a mistake was uh, after WTO, when China, when China entered WTO, in that, in that first decade after that, I think the U.S. should have been more vigilant and more direct with China on what their expectations were as they went along, rather than simply hoping that things were going to go in the right direction and kind of sort themselves out. And so the complaints about um, theft of intellectual property, uh, the rules around joint ventures, technology transfer, all of that um, could and should have been dealt with more directly, earlier, and in more depth. And I think things wouldn't have gotten quite as uh, difficult as they got. And then all of those things, which in, 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 uh, in ordinary times could be dealt with, in the context of what I was just talking about, uh, become much, much more difficult to handle. Let's talk about your role. Uh, John, um, you've been traveling over the years uh, to China, including during the pandemic times. And as you said, went through the quarantine uh, experiences like no other. Um, uh, and now devoting a lot of your time. How do you see yourself at this moment? What is driving it? For better or for worse, my first degree was in history. So <laughs> I, I always think about historical context. and. And in talking to uh, friends in America, or even in talking to any American audience on the topic of US-China today, is very difficult to do. So in that context, I started thinking to myself, well, is there a better way to talk about this topic which will get more oxygen in the room and get the conversation flowing in a more constructive manner? And so I decided what I'm going to do is ask the audience to imagine the world in the future. So I, I picked arbitrarily the, 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 uh, the year 2050. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's imagine the year 2050. Well, in the year 2050, the best estimates are there'll be 10 billion people in the world. And today there are 8 billion. And those incremental 2 billion are going to come primarily from nine countries. And those nine countries are India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Indonesia, the DRC, and the United States. So of those nine, other than the United States, these are essentially two billion more poor people, primarily in Africa. So by 2050, 25% of the world will be in Africa. As we sit here today, if, you, if, you, if there were such a thing as the CEO of the world, uh, one of his big problems would be, what do I do about Africa in the next several decades? Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, the U.S. and China, which today together are something like 42% of global GDP, by 2050, of course, nobody knows, but there'll be something like, they'll be north of 50%, mm -hmm. maybe as high as 60%. So there'll be higher concentration of wealth and many more poor people. 
And we already know, even today, that's not a good combination. And every single issue you can think of, climate change, pandemic, uh, terrorism, you name it. Yeah. All those issues get worse in that, in that world. So I asked, the, I asked the audience, in that world I just described, who thinks it's a good idea that the world's two most powerful, two wealthiest countries should spend most of their time arguing with each other, let alone fighting with each other? It can't make any sense. And, and we don't have the luxury of spending the next decade figuring that out. So when you ask what's my role, so I say to myself, I think that anybody who is paying attention, who has energy and some talent, ought to be dedicating him or herself to making whatever contribution he or she can to getting the world to that place, the place where the two most powerful countries realize it's absolutely vital that we have a good relationship. Because every single issue, everyone in the world knows, every single important global issue will get solved faster or managed better if the two leading countries are working together. And so that's my, my own sort of passion and goal, is to try to contribute to that in whatever way I can. It's a very fragmented world. Everybody has an opinion about everything. How do you, as a critical bridge already between China and the United States, filter the information that you're receiving all the time, digest them, I would have sleepless nights, not like you. You're having great sleep, right? Um, how, how did that work for you? What is that process like for you? You know, I guess all of us know what we're good at and what we're not so good at. And what I'm good at, and I have been, and I've, and I've honed it over the years, I'm good at, at determining what's really fundamental here and long-lasting and core to what I'm trying to do and what is not. What is that core then? Well, the core is that, is what I, is what I was saying a second ago, which is, that, which is that the two countries must, in the end, understand and act on the idea that they have got to have a good relationship as the leaders of the world. And by the way, as an aside, the rest of the world will insist on it. And they're, we're already seeing that. And, I, and my, in, in, uh, as I travel around the world, when I speak to a prime minister of any country or the head of state of a country, he or she invariably will say, uh, we, want, we want to have a good relationship with both the U.S. and China. We do not want to be forced to choose. Right. And we want the two of them to get along. They all say that. Now, some of them will, will, will say it to themselves privately and not publicly, and some will say it very politely, but they all say that. And, and I think both countries, both the U.S. and China, will either understand that already or certainly will understand it. John, what a pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. So nice to see you. Good to see you. That's my latest conversation with John Thornton, following a series of interviews with people in the know from both China and the United States. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight. Check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of my team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.